Welcome everyone on our Heretics edition of the Votem TV podcast. Our guest this evening is Dr. Gordon Hahn. He is a geopolitical analyst specializing in Eurasian and Russian. Dr. Hahn, it's good to see you this evening. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm doing fine. Perfect. Well, we'll uh, dive right into it. Um, Dr. Hahn, what is your general assessment of the war in Ukraine currently? And as things stand, in terms of if in terms of who's uh, winning or losing, or is that what you're yes. getting at? Yes. What, um, what, what, what is the general outline of where the events are going? Mm -hmm. Well, generally, the situation now is that it appears that the Russians are beginning to go on a bit of an offensive all along the what we what do you call crudely the eastern front down from uh, from the area of. Um, uh, around the zoom to down to uh, where the front begins to curve to the left, a little bit south of uh, Divke and, and and so forth, um, before it starts to head over to the to the west into to Zaporozhye. Um, and they're making consistent over the last week. They've been making consistent uh, but very slow uh, gains, and they've taken over about ten small towns. And it looks like they're getting ready to um, continue uh, hitting. Uh, uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, the energy system, transport system, fuel supplies, and things like this. And um, I think um, during the course of the winter, if a, if a major offensive is, is actually mounted during the course of the winter, which I think it probably will be depending on uh, the weather and the whether the terrain is uh, possible to move forward on the terrain, we will probably see a major uh, offensive which will combine those two things probably a little bit more, uh, maybe significantly more aggressively than now. And that's going to cause real problems for Ukraine because um, <clears throat> already, for example, they projected that this year the um, uh, economy of Ukraine is going to uh, have a full contraction of 40%. And they're projecting that with the electricity pro problems and transport problems being caused by the war, it's going to be another 30% next year. So you're talking about an economy by the end of next year that's less than a third of what it was when the war started at a population that's, you know, basically 75 percent of what it were, maybe even 80 percent or 85 percent of what it was before the war started. And that's just not sustainable uh, politically, even with, uh, you know, the control over the media by the by the government and so forth. Um, plus, uh, the electricity issue and the transport issue means it's going to be very difficult to move troops from one front to the other. Uh, and assuming you know, the Russians have a plan of sort of alternating emphasis on, on various fronts, that would be cause a problem. Or the Russians can just pick uh, a certain front uh, that's the weakest once uh, transportation becomes impossible for the Ukrainian uh, military and focus on, on that front entirely. And there'll be a very difficult, there'll be a major problem kind of trying to uh, reinforce um, that point, that weak point, because they can't move their troops. There may not, may not be enough fuel. Railroad, railroad, lines, railroad route lines are out. Electricity lines are out. So I think this uh, summer and certainly uh, this uh, winter and certainly once the uh, muddy season ends in spring, um, the Ukrainians are going to have major problems unless, of course, NATO and the West severely ratchet up assistance to Ukraine, uh, but there seem to be, you know, political and and even uh, supply limits on, 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 on that. So it looks like by the end of the year, by next year, by the end of next year, you know, we should even, even into the fall, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Ukraine moving towards uh, negotiations. Um, I think the Russians are already playing for the long game. They, they understand that it's, it's going to be a battle, um, but that in the long run, they definitely wear out the Ukrainian army and uh, and and the system it's, itself, and um, they should be able to put them in a position where the Ukrainians will finally decide to come to the table again. Do you think um, many analysts are uh, in the states and not only in the Anglosphere, so to say, are saying that Putin basically has given up on on uh, on any format of negotiations? And he's willing to uh, settle this only on the battlefield. So he's basically doing what, uh, it's funny because it's a paradox what Ferguson on the battlefields. Do you think Putin has 
made the decision that okay, uh, I'm not I'm not pushing Zelensky anymore towards the negotiating <clears throat> table. I'm just uh, evolving the battlefield situation to my advantage just before I do the major hit with obviously General Surovikin at the helm. Has, has he ruled out negotiations at this point in your view? No, I don't think he's ruled out negotiations, but I think that he, he probably is realistic at this point in understanding that it's going to take a major offensive and a major, you know, a significant, uh, a clear a clear sense that the Russians are going to win, that that will force uh, Zelensky to the table, or it may force uh, people in um, in Kiev to to get rid of Zelensky if he doesn't want to do that. Um, so it's really, the, the, I mean, these are two two sides of the same coin. The offensive is a means by which you get to um, negotiations. That doesn't mean necessarily that negotiations will happen, uh, and 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 uh, then a whole can of worms is opened up because. Uh, the Russians are faced with, you know, the idea with uh, either having to go all the way up to the Dnieper uh, and taking everything in um, eastern Ukraine. Uh, and then the question is, can the Ukrainians still be doing damage from across the Dnieper? And then do the Russians decide to cross the Dnieper? And it becomes sort of a, a never-ending process of trying to secure <laughs> your flank. And it's they sort of fall into the trap that, that NATO fell into when it, it, be, it began to expand. So first they brought in Poland, Hungary, and, Czech, and, and the Czech Republic into NATO. And then in order to protect Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, they need to continue expanding, right? They had to uh, secure the northern frank, flank, so they had to go into the Baltics. And then they had to go into southeastern Europe. Uh, and so you once you begin this process uh, with this kind of mentality, mentality, rather than trying to negotiate with the center of the other side, <laughs> you run into this uh, major problem. Now it would be, would be nice, right? If if the Americans, if if the Russians, still have even a slight incl inclination to trust the Americans, uh, maybe in this kind of situation they would. If the if the Americans made it quite clear and could, could present some clear evidence that they've convinced Zelensky that he has to go to the negotiating table, then maybe that would uh, you know hold the Russians' hands uh, hand. So maybe the Russians. Um, and there have we have seen that the feelers between uh, Sullivan and so forth, and uh, Patrushev's uh, supposedly meeting, and there was an agreement on an apparent agreement on the withdrawal from Kherson, where the Ukrainians did not fire on the Russians while they were withdrawing. Uh, so, you know, there there is still hope, I think, and there is we can see this also <clears throat> in the fact that both sides are taking strong uh, efforts to avoid escalation. So this is all on the positive that. These our, our leaders have not gotten completely <laughs> insane, and they understand the risks and the dangers. Uh, doesn't mean that they can handle them all. That which makes the situation uh, hardly uh, uh, quieting. But n nevertheless, we under we we see that there are attempts to try to contain the situation. And in the long run, at some point, somebody's going to begin to lose, or both sides are going to be tired of a stalemate, and they're going to come to the negotiating table. So that's the sort of. The positive spin, and hopefully that all that will fold out uh, unfold next year. Right. So to quote uh, Dean Rusk, we're still on our way eyeball to eyeball. Uh, just, just nobody hasn't blinked yet. But right, how exactly. would you interpret Macron's words? Uh, Macron's words that were he said to uh, I think in an interview with uh, French TV. I think it was after his visit with Biden or during his stay in the United States, where he made it clear that uh, in the future, in the near future at least, after all is settled, uh, and even right now, the West does need to take into account Russia's legitimate security interests. And this is a term that I'm now, and it's interesting to see it on the lips of the West. So do you interpret that as the West in a way, or at least parts of the West, breaking and signaling to Zelensky that you have to back down and at the same time to Putin that, okay, uh, we're not friends, but at least we're willing to sit down at a table together and start at least uh, some sort of negotiate, negotiating process. Or is this some one-off from Macron? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's uh, precisely what's going on. And he's probably somewhat <clears throat> encouraged by the fact that there have been statements, although some of them have been, been pulled back, like, Milley's statement about the need for negotiations and so forth, that he probably understands there's a bit of a difference of opinions within the Biden administration, uh, 
and therefore he can you know play on on the, on that and and put forward this idea it's 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 unfortunate that he or germany or both did not do this before uh and they've had you know ever since they the russians first put this idea of reorganizing the uh security architecture for europe way back in 2008 14 years ago when medvedev put it on the table and it was ignored and we went through everything that we've gone through through the last 14 years including a, a coup in maidan and so forth leading to this uh leading to this situation uh it's really it shows what a tragedy and <laughs> this really is uh in terms of just poor poor western leadership and and, and leadership in washington uh, lack of diplomatic skills and lack of vision and understanding of the risks and at, on on the one hand you know over constantly overstating the extent to which Putin is uh, dangerous and evil and so forth and at the same time playing the most dangerous game of inciting him uh, two things that just simply don't go together then it's not it doesn't make it does not make a logical uh, policy um, it would be nice to see, you're, you're also seeing some other cracks in the edifice um, between Europe and the United States in in, in a way uh, with uh, Schultz's visit to uh, uh, China, in which uh, basically he understands that he doesn't want to fall into the trap of being dependent on the American economy, and they've they've lost access to the Russian economy, so they're they're going to China, uh, trying to replace what they've lost, uh, and who knows what other messages Schultz may have delivered to the Chinese, for example, asking them somehow to intervene. Uh, on 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 the side of uh, a negotiated settlement to the war, maybe offer to be a a, a, a locus, a forum for um, peace talks. Um, so I think there's an understanding, a certain understanding in Europe, that the Americans are overplaying their hand. Um, that there's an irresponsible element to the <laughs> leadership of the Biden administration, which is writ large in domestic politics, but also is evident in foreign policy and um i think that the macron statement is a, is a sign of that dr han you have written uh i haven't read it yet to, to admit but I've, I've read reviews of your book on the uh vigilance and security and russian understanding one of the arguments mm -hmm. that we continue to keep on hearing and it's turned into a meme even on social media i seen this on twitter for example today uh where people say that NATO, anyway, uh, a danger to Russia. Uh, Russia is mm -hmm. creating a threat because NATO has never attacked Russia. Uh, NATO mm -hmm. is obviously a defensive mm -hmm. alliance only. You have an acute understanding of how the Russian psyche perceives threats, whether we like it or not, coming from the outside. So are mm -hmm. the Russians justified in seeing the potential of NATO becoming an offensive force directed against them uh, sometime in the near future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just looking looking at this through the prism of the future and the past. <coughs> in terms of the future, if the if the Russians are are oper operating on the uh, the strange idea of democratic peace theory that democratic countries don't go don't, don't go to war with each other and are reluctant to go to war with authoritarian regimes even, and that the NATO alliance is a defensive alliance and so there's nothing to fear. Well, uh, history shows that the nature of regimes, the nature of international organizations, even. Uh, can change. So the idea that you have uh, world history's most powerful military bloc along Russia's borders is problematic in the future. When you add in the historical past that Russia has in relations with the West, beginning with um, the Smuta and the, the Vatican support and the Polish support for the, the false Dmitri, leading to a uh, time of troubles, so there's of course Smuta, and that was uh, one of probably one could argue worse than the experience the Rus the Russians would have in the Great Patriotic War, then Napoleon's invasion, then uh, then the uh, World War II and Hitler's invasion. The Russians have a uh, instinctive fear of any kind of military threat approaching their western border. They learned this over th over three centuries. Now they may exaggerate it at times for instrumental purposes to in negotiating and so forth and so on. But it's, you know, you go to Russia and you talk to any Russian, no matter whether it's a member of the elite, whether it's a, a middle class person, um, <clears throat> political elite, economic elite, anybody. Uh, 
Um, they will tell you they will they will express suspicion towards the West, suspicion towards the United States, and they'll invoke these historical experiences. So this is not something that Putin, you know, conjures up and exaggerates and makes up. This is part of Russia's political and strategic culture. Uh, similar, the same the same thing we can say in terms of domestic politics. Part of the game in in the West has always been to meddle in Russian politics. Uh, in order to achieve certain foreign policy ends that a particular great power or another uh, in the West wanted to achieve, um, whether being involved in palace coups in the 18th century, uh, going back, you know, interference even during during the Cold War. Cold War, we can use an example. The Smuta is another example earlier earlier on, uh, where they wanted to place a, a pro uh, pro Catholic uh, uh, person on the on, on the throne. And wanting to go on and on, there are a whole, a whole series of Examples and this puts Russians on guard uh, towards uh, Western interference in domestic politics. So when opposition Russian figures go to the West, uh, uh, receive money from the West, this raises flags, especially among among more security-minded elements in the in the state and society. And that means you know the security services, the military, and so forth, and and conserv conserv conservative-minded. Uh, uh private citizens and experts and so forth and so on so um it's absolutely should have been expected anybody who had an understanding of russian culture and russian strategic culture should have understood there were people who talked about this kenan talks about it uh mearsheimer sort of uses a, and 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 walt they did they, the international ir theory specialists tend to use more um uh I, to contemporary ir theory of a realist approach towards ir politics to explain all this and that's certainly a major part of it and that goes back to this issue of looking towards the future and wondering well what what are we going to do about this 100 years from now when there's this um, major military block even more ensconced in or in and around our borders uh, what are we going to do so again it's a i don't know if it's a, a our mistakes are a consequence of <clears throat> moving more towards sort of rational choice theory of uh uh, interpret interpretations of of, um, of Russian politics, and a sort of uh, combined with a kind of uh, over exaggerated sense of our our own destiny as uh, sort of messianic democrats who are to spread dem democracy across the whole world, and therefore we have a right to do certain things at the expense of stability in other countries. Uh, but we have to understand there's a there's a cost for that. We alienate a lot of people. And sometimes we alienate enough people in a certain country that that leads to the exact opposite result of what we want to attain. Well, lessons still to be learned, at least from the current trajectory of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Hahn, you noticed that the media for the last few months um, has been playing uh, the chief of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, General Zaluzhny. There was even a fawning uh, profile of him in Time magazine, which, as Tucker Carlson said last night, probably has only four readers left. <laughs> it's interesting in and of <laughs> itself. But uh, in that interview, in that interview, uh, Zaluzhna made an interesting statement that uh, he has read all of General Gerasimov's works, mm -hmm. and he has very great respect of the uh, commander. Um, what do you think? Uh, is the West contemplating using Zaluzhny? as somebody who might replace Zelensky in the event of him being abolished uh, in peaceful or violent ways? There may be some people uh, in the West who are thinking along those lines. It's probably a little early left for the number of people and the level at which they work to have reached such a critical mass that something will happen. However, when <laughs> Zelensky does things like he did with the uh, Ukrainian missile that hit Poland, and then after it's proven that it was a Ukrainian rocket, continues to insist that it was a Russian rocket, um, and things along these lines, um, that opens up the floodgates to, uh, of you know it may it may it may tip off some that maybe a lot of the things that Zelensky has said in the past are not exactly um, uh, up to snuff, and then when you consider that we're putting ourselves our own security on the line to protect him. It begins to. It could get to the point where people in Washington D.C. get this is get to the point where they say this is a character who's simply not stable enough and experienced enough uh, in politics uh, 
uh, for us to be risking our own national security and the in, in the security of the entire West and, in fact, the, the entire world. Uh, and at some point, maybe they would take someone like uh, Zeluzhny and uh, re replace Zelensky or support uh, a move by uh, Zeluzhny. I don't think we're quite there yet, but um, there's sort of there is a dynamic I think that that's that, that's that uh, developing in that direction and um, could come to fruition. Uh, as a geopolitical analyst, a uh, very specific question, considering where I am. Uh, in Poland, uh, Lower Silesia to be exact. Uh, Iskanders can still hit here. The Iskanders can mm -hmm. still hit here. Uh, just a word of uh, opinion on the role of Poland in this entire situation mm -hmm. February 24th, because it seems that we have been as a state, to some extent as a nation, the most willing executioner, e even more than what we might call uh, the deep state in Washington, of this entire agenda of what Austin called trying to weaken Russia via Ukraine. How do you view this turbulent situation? Yeah, I think Poland's a, a, a top contender for the uh, nomination of chief, of chief ar arsonist in, 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 this, uh, in this process. Um, uh, beginning with uh, firstly one of the major things that, that began uh, that was introduced after the beginning of the war was the um, this idea that you that Polish citizens now have the status of Ukrainian citizens, which probably served as a kind of a legal cover for having Russian having Polish um, soldiers uh, take off their Polish uniforms, go into Ukraine and, and fight. And of course, of course, uh, Colonel McGregor and other people have stated that the, there actually are thousands of Polish uh, uh, soldiers fighting in that way. And I would imagine, uh, I think Colonel McGregor also stated that, uh, Douglas, Colonel Douglas McGregor also stated that there were Roma Romanian soldiers doing that as well. Plus, Poland has sort of played um, a role of partnering with all the Baltic states and with the Brits, who are also all contenders for the, 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 the um, uh, award for chief chief arsonist in, 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 towards escalating this war uh and in fact they even have formed a sort of a an in uh semi-formal kind of alliance within or actually outside of of nato um which is uh certainly concerning it was good to see there was a uh, there was a there was no attempt by the poles when the missile incident occurred um to go along with zelensky and push things uh, any any uh, further. So that's a good sign. That indicates that at least the polls are do realize also the dangers involved, um, and uh, will will only go so far. Again, the problem is with people going um, a certain distance. Uh, going that distance may be too far <laughs> in in general, and may cause circumstances that they get out of control. But generally speaking, I think again, there's a sense that we need to watch ourselves. We don't need to have a war with, uh, with Russia. Do, do you see in a, in a sort of parallel scenario uh, a potential role where Poland, if it sort of regained its, I don't know if we can call it that, sovereigntist cojones, playing a potentially positive role along with Hungary, for example, in trying to pressure Kiev into peace talks? Do you have... Uh, or would have uh, a positive uh, reverberation in terms of how Moscow sees its actions in Ukraine, that they see if Poland is pushing Ukraine, we can sit down at the negotiating table all the quicker because we know that a serious state in Eastern Europe is actually trying to mm -hmm. settle things uh, mm -hmm. on a mutually beneficial basis. Right. Well, if that at that point, if the Poles were already pushing for some kind of a negotiated uh, uh, settlement, presumably many, many other states in Western Europe already would be doing that. Um, but the addition of the Poles, who are really, you know, the great power in, in Eastern, um, in Eastern Europe, um, would be of um, major significance. And I think, you know, could, could certainly tip the scales in favor of a, um, a final push to begin negotiations without, without a doubt. Um, question is, uh, the question is, uh, it's my daughter. <laughs> um, Welcome everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Say hello if you want. Say hello quickly. Say hello. 
Hello. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have the, uh, the, uh, the future generation of realism right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, the polls could uh, definitely uh, certainly play a, a, posit a positive role, but uh, that would change. That would require a, a, a change in orientation uh, from the one that's uh, exists now. But at this point, they've been the cheerleaders for ratcheting things up against uh, Russia. Going back to uh, Ukraine itself, uh, do you think more annexations are in store uh, on the part of the Russians? Or what would it take for, for example, for Odessa uh, to come back to uh, Mother Russia? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> at this point, I think that since the war has turned out to be more difficult than perhaps they expected in Moscow, maybe uh, they would be satisfied with just a land bridge to Crimea. As long as they have the land bridge to Crimea, they can hold that up as a, a major victory. Um, and that means just taking, basically holding what they hold now. They wouldn't have to do anything else. Um, moving to Odessa is going gonna, is gonna to stretch out resources at a time when it's been, they haven't been out, having a hard time moving forward, even to the point now where they, they, they do not control all of the uh, Lugansk People's Republic and uh, or Lugansk Oblast and Donetsk. Oblast as they were configured under the Ukrainian constitution. Um, so they have to gain that territory back. In theory, they could even reject, uh, uh, give up on that as long, and, and claim victory with the land bridge to Crimea. But going on to Odessa means, you know, extending, uh, extending out their uh, resources. And I think at this point, um, that idea is probably being given up on. Um, I don't think that uh, necessarily taking additional republics was was in the in the in the original plan i think the original plan was to move in towards kiev hope that zelensky f fled and the government fled from kiev and the, the the government would fall into chaos and the russians could go into kiev with uh, minimal uh resistance um and then would have and then uh, continue the an offensive uh from the east from the um from the east and seize Donbass and Lugansk, and then and that would have been the end of it. That's my that my sense is that's what they wanted to do initially. And that would have saw, would have accomplished all three of the attacks that the attacks that that Putin laid out at the beginning beginning of the war. That is demilitarization, denazification, and um, uh, protecting Don the Russian speaking population in Donetsk, in Lugansk. So um, again, I'm not I'm. Far from one of those who believes that the Putin's goal is to seize all of Ukraine, I think that's the last thing he would want to do because that would bring Russia right up to a border with NATO, uh, which would not protect Russian security at all. Having Ukraine, some sort of a Ukraine, even if it's a rump Ukraine, say only Western Ukraine, west of the Dnieper, um, is a nice buffer zone, um, which Russians uh, often like to have in the east. So. Um, uh, I think it's some kind of agreement along those along those lines is is possible. I think that what needs to happen is the Russians need to put you know Zelensky's back up against the wall and understand that if he doesn't stop the war, then the Russians could actually go to the Dnieper uh, and they could level uh, they could level Kiev, or they don't even have to level Kiev. They can just level the entire electricity system, the entire transport system, and Kiev will be, become a depopulated uh, ghost town. And he'll have to set up camp in Lvov, and there'll be sort of a wasteland in between Lvov and Dnieper, where, in which you might see, you know, occasional firing of artillery and rockets uh, back and forth, and that could last for many years. That'd be a terrible, terrible scenario, but one cannot e exclude that sort of thing. Uh, plus, you would probably see, you know, guerrilla partisan warfare against the Russians and terrorist attacks with, in the Russians in the more in the areas closer, you know, in, in, in Dnipro Oblast and so forth, closer to the Dnieper River on the uh, Russian side, put it, put it crudely, of the Dnieper River for years to come. So it would be a very, very um, messy end. I think Putin needs a negotiated settlement um, in the end to avoid all these sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sw uh, being in a situation where he's mired in a, war, guerrilla Vietnam style war with that he can't uh, get out of. Um, and that that is another reason why I think 
in the West, there may be some hesitation to be removing uh, Zelensky. Because now Putin views Zelensky as as, a, as the only viable partner. Of course, if Zelensky came to power and they kicked out Zelensky, that also might be a good opening for Putin to say, okay, well, now there's a new leadership. Let's see if we can't talk to them. If Assuming that the Russians have already put them on the uh, uh, in a very bad military political situation to begin with which, you know, according to the scenario we've been discussing, would be the pretext for removing Zelensky. You know, as long as things, as long as things are in, a, in, in terms of a, a stalemate and barely tolerable as they are now, there's probably no, in, no incentive for anyone to re remove uh, Zelensky. <clears throat> However, that if we go to the scenario where um, they evacuate the government, the current government in Kiev and Zelensky relocates, for example, to Lviv, and you have this Western Ukrainian rump state, which is more banderized than even Kiev was. Do you think Russians would be able to viably claim victory uh, if their stated goal is denazification? If they were to leave Western Ukraine under, you know, in totally banderite colors, so to say, because as yeah. you said, Doctor Han, you would obviously have a situation where, from time to time, you you would have the shelling, most likely, have NATO trained soldiers. Uh, even in a better uh, uh, in in better shape than they were in February on February 24th. Uh, so, do you think selling that idea to the Russian public uh, from Putin would be viable in the sense that we've we've we demilitarized them up to a point, but we still, unfortunately, this is the price the price of compromise. Western Ukraine or is literally right. Banderistan now, right? And we can't right. really touch them. Do you think the Russian opi public opinion would buy that? What's your What's your take? No, I don't think they would. I, and that's why that's why he he needs to have a negotiated settlement that 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 guarantees uh, s certain things and has you know a Western NATO imprimatur on it, and and so forth. Um, that would be uh, Im Im impossible to sell, even with the newly acquired territory, because the mo majority of Russians are more interested in having uh, security. And the elites more interested in having a regime that you can more or less say is uh, at best, at worst, neutral uh, in re in relation to Russia and not an enemy state. So that would be a that would be the kind. That's exactly the kind of disaster that um, would he would be confronted with this sort of a, a swamp situation that he wouldn't be able to get out of. And the only way to get out would then to be take all of Ukraine, and then he's forced to go up to the NATO border. And even in that case, if he, in Western Ukraine, the level of partisan resistance and so forth would, would be much more fierce and would last much, much longer. Um, it would not to mention the fact that it would risk uh, perhaps spilling over into the, into Poland. Uh, so, and, and we don't know, of course, how the, how, how Belarus would react or how Belarus might be involved in any kind of scenario involving having to move into Western Ukraine, uh, which opens the prospect of a wider war. So, no, that's a that's a that, that's a uh, pretty much a, a nightmare scenario, and I don't think Putin wants to go up to the Dnieper. I don't think that's his plan. I think he understands it that that he gets caught in he gets caught in a in a in a, in a trap that he can't he may not ever get out of. Um, so he needs a negotiated solution, and that requires you know a major major military victory and putting Zelensky in a position where he understands he he can't win the war. The only thing he can do is either continue to fight a losing war of attrition in which you know, another 100, 200,000, 300,000 uh, Ukrainian soldiers are, are killed. Hundreds of thousands more are wounded. Civilians are killed. Cities are destroyed. Uh, and anything that looks like the old Ukraine is is gone. Um, you know, at what point do you <laughs> uh, continue to fight for, you know, your own political life and for your own, um, you know, pride and even national pride? Uh, on the other end, of course, he has the problem of the ultranationalists who probably will not want to surrender at all. And if he does move towards negotiations, um, he may be at risk from uh, them being overthrown. And there, there are also concerns about Zeluzhny in this regard, because um, one of Zeluzhny's um, top advisors is the founder of the ultra-right neo-fascist group, right sector, Dmitry Yarosh. And just recently, Zeluzhny posed, so supposedly, I haven't been able to verify this photograph yet, but there was a, did, a photograph did appear on various telegram channels with uh, Zeluzhny post, uh, posed before a picture of um, 
Stefan Bandera. Um, so that is uh, those two things raise uh, the, the Dane, <laughs> raise a, a flag, a signal that perhaps he himself is somewhat inclined towards this uh, ultra nationalism, maybe even neo fascism, or wholly accepts them in a way much more than uh, Zelensky at least did. Now Zelensky is also being forced to accept them because it's a lifeline for him, just as Poroshenko did uh, <laughs> when he was president, because they're, they're a potent force, despite what certain elements in the West would like to say, because they only get, uh, a certain candidate gets only 2% of the vote in a, in a presidential election. Well, that's, that's, that's not the game that the neo-fascists play. They're not interested in elections. Um, further, furthermore, they had candidates they had candidates uh, spread out across various parties, um, not just their own parties. So you really can't use uh, uh, that parameter, the parameter of, say, results in parliamentary elections, because some of the so-called centrist parties had neo-fascists uh, among them. Um, so it's a very, uh, very difficult situation. But yes, uh, but, but no, I don't think Putin, Putin could not sell to the situation that we were talking about at the beginning as a victory in, in no way, no way. I think even with his control, that, even with his control over the media and propaganda and so forth, I don't see him being able to sell that because we've seen already um, when he really when they uh, exchanged prisoners and 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 gave back some of the uh, Azov command uh, back to uh, Kiev, and then the withdrawal from Harrison and from Kharkov, Kharkov even more. Um, the uh, right wing in Russia. You know, also rose up against uh, Putin. Now, of course, Putin has a much better handle on the situation than Zelensky does in the situation in in Ukraine. And nonetheless, you know, if this war drags out three or four years. We're talking about a Putin who's much older, a country that's much more tired of a war. And if the war ends up looking like a failure, well, there may be some people in the Kremlin who say, "Okay, it's time for Vladimir Vladimirovich to go off to his dacha, and for somebody else to take uh, the throne in the Kremlin." <laughs> I think unless that photo of Zaluzhny behind Bandera's with Bandera's portrait behind him wasn't photoshopped, it might have been better for him if he had a portrait of Gerasimov, who he claims to admire so much. Behind <laughs> That'll uh, look better in the Kremlin, at least, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but we'll see that Actually, goes. that's another point uh, that's interesting. The, uh, another Han interesting. Sorry to interrupt you. Just one. Mm -hmm. inch, but that's another interesting point is this uh, respect that Zaluzhny has for Gerasimov. That could also play as a positive factor in leading somehow to negotiations, right? Uh, these positive words about uh, Gerasimov in the future. Yeah, I was, uh, as I said, I, I read uh, pieces of article in Time magazine, and I was really surprised because he didn't say nothing negative about him. He's a, a master of the arts, and there's nobody better than Gerasimov. So who knows? Maybe it was, you know, a sort of wink, wink to the Kremlin mm -hmm. <laughs> via Time magazine. I don't think too many Western mm -hmm. readers understood what he was trying to say, if he was saying it, obviously. But it was an interesting mm -hmm. point, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Han, you've, re you've written extensively on the uh, Chechen jihadi movement. And I've seen reports ever since February 24th, some of them actually came up pretty early, that Ukraine is utilizing some members of, for example, ISIS and other jihadi groups to fight on their side against the Russians. What have you been hearing on this uh, on the I haven't found any evidence to support that. Um, it, it is, it's more likely that they're, he, that they've tapped into um, non-jihadi um, Chechen elements in Europe, you know, people that used to be close to or around uh, Zakayev, uh, the people who had a difference with the jihadization of the Chechen Republic of Echkaria, as it was called, and then became the Caucasus Emirate, and now the majority of it is, is, an, is an affiliate of ISIS. I think it's more likely that they've tapped into some of those people than rather than um, uh, outright jihadists because of the, the simply there would be a risk that the jihadists would then <laughs> um, ensconce themselves somehow in a in a destabilized Ukraine or cause trouble. Um, particularly if uh, the Ukrainians, by some miracle, happen to <laughs> take back Crimea, in which case um, there would be claims that this is Muslim. Uh, territory and uh, so you wouldn't. I, I don't. I, I have doubts, and I haven't seen any evidence that uh, that's the case. Um, but uh, European Chechens, um, uh, I would not be surprised at all that they're 
when I say European Chechens, I mean che Chechens who were in the emigration in Europe, uh, uh, being involved on the Ukrainian side. I would not be surprised. So you have the uh, you have the possibility of Chechens fighting Chechens uh, <laughs> along the front in Ukraine. What are your thoughts on the uh, current uh, Arab Chinese? We're sort of moving south right now, but uh, on the geopolitical map. But we know there's a Chinese Arab summit taking place in Riyadh right now. Mm -hmm. And from uh, the way that Xi Jinping was uh, welcomed in Saudi Arabia, it seems as if they're welcoming the great. Uh, emperor of the east it was interesting uh that there's so much uh, so much pomp in all this uh where do you think the or how do you predict the results of this uh summit will play out because there's a lot of speculation that behind the scenes mm -hmm. there will obviously be discussions about the coming certain death of the petrodollar how do you think mm -hmm. things will play out behind the scenes during this uh, summit mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, uh, this is part of a longer, of a larger and longer story of the alienation of Saudi Arabia from the West, and then the larger story being the the Sino-Russian attempt to build an alternative um, world order um, separate uh, from the West. And the Saudis have been um, not be surprised if the summit produced an agreement that the um, Chinese would pay for Saudi oil in in the yuan. That's uh, be a logical outcome of this, or at least talks, serious talks about how and get, getting to that, how to, to get to that. Um, the other thing is we can expect probably that Xi will bring up uh, both the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and perhaps um, even in a possible future membership in, say, BRICS, because there's now talk about um, not that there would be in a first wave of uh, expansion of BRICS, but maybe in a, in a second or third wave. But uh, Saudi Arabia is already, as I believe, an observer member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or a dialogue partner, I think is the correct phrase. And I would expect that that trend um, would continue. And that's not just for Saudi Arabia. That is a pattern that we see occurring throughout the so-called, what we use the old term, uh, third world in in Latin American countries, in African countries, and in the Middle East and in Asia, um, many countries now are, are beginning to move towards this Sino-Russian attempt to create this new um, world order. The most recent uh, announcement was this idea to create an alternative to Visa and MasterCard, that the, the, Sino, the, the Chinese, the Russians, and the Indians, and a, and a host of other countries have decided to get involved in using... Um, various payment systems that they've established in their own in their own countries combining them into one large alternative payment system and then of course there's discussion about uh, development banks uh, alternative uh, financial systems monetary system um, so this is a, a growing trend and i think this is just one more step in that direction a big step because we're talking about saudi arabia and the oils uh, and the oil reserves there and china needs as much uh, oil as it can get so yeah dr han one final question uh because recently there has been in poland that the words that were spoken by the late president lech kaczynski in 2008 at that uh, gather port of georgia during the georgian russian war that today Russia has attacked Georgia, this is 2008. Next, they will attack Ukraine, and then possibly my country, referring to Poland. We obviously know that Lech Kaczynski died in that tragic plane crash in Smolensk on April, in April 2010. However, his words uh, are being used today as a sort of uh, justification of his prophetic insight that, yes, see, Lech Kaczynski was right, that the Russians, once they finish, they're going to be coming for Poland. So I ask you as somebody who has, as I said, extensively studied Russian vigilance and Russian security concerns. Uh, in, in the last 30 years, was there ever a conception in Russian uh, defense circles, in the Siloviki circles, in any major circles that were connected to power that would consider uh, an invasion of Poland at some point? Uh, therefore, you know, justifying the fears of so many, many Poles who believe that, that we have NATO, we we have to support Ukraine because once the Ukrainians for sure coming for Poland, what's your take? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, even people who are only 10, even the most radical um, and most tendential, tangentially connected to the elite, not the Kremlin, but the elite in, um, in Moscow, uh, a person like Alexander Dugin, for example, has never made uh, a statement that the, that the Russians should go into Poland militarily. Now, he has talked about the idea that Russia can turn Poland and Eastern Europe against the West, uh, but he's never made any claims about um, m moving into Poland. What the statement like um, Lechensky's um, mistake, mistaken, uh, made, uh, mis misses <laughs> is that um, in both cases, Georgia and Ukraine, there were actions taken by the West and by the Georgians and then by the Ukrainians that led to um, Russia acting as it did. If there was, if there had never been NATO expansion after uh, the, the end of the Cold War, there is no way Russian troops would have ever been uh, in uh, South Ossetia. There is no way uh, little green men would have appeared in Crimea, and there is no way. Um, uh, that the uh, Russian forces would have intervened in Donbass, and there's no way February, uh, February 24th would have occurred. They just, they are direct consequences of NATO expansion and everything that followed up to that to then lead the Russians to believe that they needed to do this. Now, we can qu question uh, whether they needed to, but in their eyes, and according to their strategic and political culture, the way they view the world, this is how they were likely to respond. Uh, people in the West were warned about this by many, many people, Talked about it before, you know, Kennan before he died, Mearsheimer, many other people have written about it. I wrote about it, many other people, uh, and they were not listened to. And the result is the result that we we have now. There's just simply no, I, can, I can't imagine any logical argument based on any kind of serious facts that could make the claim that if NATO hadn't expanded, these events in Georgia and Ukraine would have occurred. These are direct result of actions uh, taken by the West. That doesn't mean that the West is entirely guilty or the West is even for the most part guilty, but the West has uh, has a certain share of the guilt to bear and a certain responsibility in resolving the problem. Um, it's, that, it's that simple. Well, uh, one thing we can say for sure is that we need more George Kennans in Central Europe. Uh, maybe we're holding out for a George Kennensky because we have enough of Kaczynski. <laughs> Kennensky would be nice and a realist outlook. Uh, well, we'll see where the situation goes. Hopefully we can uh, talk uh, in a few weeks or a period of time when the situation evolves in Ukraine. Uh, as for tonight, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Han, for your time and for sharing your views on our channel and we hope to see you soon and all the links to your uh, books and to your blogs option box in our live stream please visit please give them a like and please uh read the analysis that dr han puts out there he's got great books also i encourage everyone to look into a serious analyst perspective because this is exactly what dr han presents thank you very much everyone dr. Han, have a good night and hope to see you soon Thank you very much for the invitation. Be glad to do it anytime you want to do it. Thank you. Take care. Take care now. Bye-bye.